All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, so I'm gonna go over some comments here, and uh, then after that, I'm gonna um, talk about this video. Just a small clip of it from the Lion of Judah. All right, guy in a car, and, and then I'm gonna talk about this preacher here from Palusa Church and this gentleman here in the backwards cap rapture radio and then I got one other, one other thing that I want to share with you which is absolutely incredible that it makes me wonder if there's a uh, what do you call that a co coerced uh, um, organized effort to teach false doctrine from a central location to me that's what it looks like now I'll get into that later possibly I'll first of all I want to address uh, a couple of these comments and I appreciate them and I really appreciate Babas Babinos however you say that yeah, because he challenges me on almost every video and I, I really like that okay so let me start off by reading his comment here uh, the biggest nightmare of these guys is history and arca oh, ar I can't say that word archaeology backing us up and proving the Bible to be historic historical right <clears throat> so that's a good point right there because the the historical evidence is overwhelming it's amazing and um, you know some of the favorite things that I like to look at and to share with others is Noah's Ark, um, the parting of the Red Sea, and the Rock of Horeb, and we can just go with the the geolo uh, what do you, what would you call that the geological uh, the you know the countries that are in the Bible that still exist today and so forth so on and so forth and the fact that we are in what they call I guess what we call 2023 AD meaning that we are in the 2023rd year of our Lord Jesus Christ the whole world essentially goes by the timeline of Jesus Christ when he was born all right and so and, and I'm sure there's a whole bunch of other stuff but yeah I mean it's overwhelming right he didn't get he didn't just get swallowed by a whale to be puked later we suppose it was a whale it was a whale and he died it wasn't a crocodile I'll tell you that okay it was a whale and he died well did Jonas really die but God let him live again this is mentioned for Jesus as a parallel as if his life was a precursor to Jesus in his resurrection after three days yeah okay so and I guess in my brain I'm thinking is there any suggestion that not, that Jonas died uh, it doesn't matter I'll look at this later I just assumed that he was alive the whole time no um gee whiz that's a heck of a statement For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, I mean, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. I, for, you know, for whatever reason, that's, that's not coming to mind. The idea that Jonas was dead. Jonah or Jonas. Alright, constructive criticism. The rest of the video is not a rebuttal. Answering the first two sentences or minutes does not debunk all the arguments. 
look okay here's the issue when you lay out a whole bunch of stuff on the table and the first thing I pick up on the table is wrong you can forget about the rest of what's on the table all right so I see this quite often all right so like for example somebody says well the Bible's full of errors and I say okay show me one error and then they list about 25 to 50 errors well look if you don't get one you're not gonna get the rest you know if you don't get one you're not gonna get the whole so that's why I I just point out one thing and that's that should be enough if you don't get that one thing you're not gonna get the whole thing right because uh, for example uh, the foundation is built on there's a, foul, a faulty foundation that you're building your doctrine on and it's no good the whole, the whole doctrine's no good because the foundation is no good so it it's a vain effort to uh, what do you call that what do you call what's your word for it? debunk it's it it's vain it's worthless to debunk all the arguments when the very first presentation of your argument is based the foundation is on a lie based on a lie that's no good so in Eric Dubai's argument against the Bible he presents a gentleman that claims that the serpent said to Adam and Eve where's your shorts and the serpent never said that and the thing that I find um, the most uh, irritating I don't know if that's the right word disgusting maybe I don't know but in Genesis 3 the reason it's not look the serpent when before they ate from the before Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil they were naked and the serpent beguiled Eve when she was naked they didn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and then all of a sudden their clothes fell off so what were I mean you're missing the whole point man when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil their eyes were open and then they could see uh oh we're naked they couldn't see that before and so there's a consequence to having this knowledge of good and evil so I mean uh, to me it, it when you start off your presentation and completely ignorant and mocking the Word of God your whole foundation is wrong so that was um, that was the point that I was making there um, and I no way in the world would I expect Eric to buy it to watch my video and so here he says uh, this is how it should be done he's talking about uh, how should it be done here you first have to come to Christ with reasoning here then the Holy Spirit will change you alright so I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you but the tactic that I will use is I will show one thing wrong if you got one thing wrong your whole entire thing is wrong and so if Eric Dubai wanted to know the Lord Jesus he has been given all the information that he is needed he himself says he grew up in a church his parents were stout Christians he said he's read the Bible from cover to cover so now he's got no excuse whatsoever He's heard it, and he's rejected it.
No. There's nothing I can do. Really, I can't save anybody. I can't even save myself. So, uh, it, you know, by chance, whether he, whether it's him or somebody else, if they were to watch the video, maybe there's something that I can present that'll help somebody see something that they did not see before. Maybe this will help them to think about something that they did not think about before. And the reason why I think this for me is the most effective way to teach is because I remember all those conversations I had before I was saved. And it was always one thing that got me thinking. And I always tried to uh, compensate on the other side for to counter whatever point was being made and uh, but you know looking reflecting back obviously I didn't know anything <laughs> you know for example when somebody says to me uh, all the prophecies of the Bible are being fulfilled well I have no idea what the Bible says so I can't counter that and that's a one thing that one person said at one time in my life that had a tremendous impact so this is why I want to focus on one thing and once you consider one point then maybe you'll consider the rest of the story right alright so anyways I don't want to get too much into philosophical things here so let's get into um, uh, let me, well, hold on a second now. I appreciate this long book that you read there, and I appreciate it very much. I did read the whole thing before. All right. Um, and also, uh, there's maybe one more thing that I wanted to... Oh, I've got... <laughs> I have to address this. All right. First of all, 1 Peter 3.15. I have to address this. First Peter chapter three verse fifteen. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let God in your hearts and always, I'm sorry, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense. See, right there, that tells me, you what you're implying is that I can't trust the Bible that I hold in my hands. You see, that's a problem. Because if I can't trust the Bible that I hold in my hands, then I have nothing. Alright, so in theory, you know, let's just say there is no Bible. There's no foundation. We, I'll just say whatever I want to say, and then you just say whatever you want to say. And then we try to reconcile the differences of our own thoughts and imaginations. That's all we'd have. It would be all vanity. But we have to have a foundation. We have to have the pure Word of God. We have to have a book, a Bible, a written scripture that we can point to and say, all right, this is the foundation for our discussion. All right, without that foundation, and nothing matters. And there, I don't know if there's another way I can say that. I really don't. That it's as simple as that. Without that foundation, our conversation is meaningless. We cannot have a, you know, we cannot build upon what's been laid. 
if there's nothing that's been laid that is sound. We cannot build a house upon a foundation that is faulty. I don't know how else to say it. I could say it a hundred times. I've already said it before, but it's and it's always going to hold true. You cannot build where there is no foundation. Therefore, we must have a perfect Bible we can point to. And so we can both say, this is what God says. All right. And so whatever Bible version, I could look it up here. Here, I'll look it up. And just try to figure out, what are you reading from? And I could show you it's corrupt. It's no good. It's, like I was talking about before, if one part is no good, the whole thing is no good. Uh, the Amplified Bible, is that what you look at all these corrupt versions? Amplified is pretty popular. Right? The ESV. Is this what you're. No, but in your. Oh, that's not even close. Well, what's the Amplified said? I mean, you, you were pretty specific in your quote here. I mean, it was pretty close. Was it the New King James? Wouldn't surprise me. There. <laughs> yep, yep, there it is. The New King James Version is not a New King James Bible at all. There's one purpose for the New King James Version, and that is to get people away from the King James Bible. And I'm telling you, this was a, con con a concentrated effort by the Roman Catholic Church to dissuade people and to get them away from the King James Bible. King James, by the way, who they tried to kill in 1605, remember, remember the 5th of November. All right, I'm telling you, these guys are as wicked and evil as any organization on the earth. And there was a time in history when they outlawed the Bible being translated into the English language. They tried it. They tried it. And they just couldn't do it. And so because they couldn't do it, because the King of England was trying was commissioned fifty four of the greatest scholars of that time to translate the Bible into the English language, because he was doing that, they tried to kill him. That didn't work. So, what they did instead was, well, we can't stop it, but what we can do is confuse it. And so that's what we see happening today, more so than ever in history, where there are all these translations, multiple, numerous, what, maybe a thousand translations, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot right here in... Bible Gateway, I've got over 50 translations that they list, and there's more that's not on here. All these translations. And now nobody knows what the heck the Bible says, right? And how do you know? This says that, and this one says this. So which one do you believe? Oh, they can't all be right. And they're not all right. There's only one right, and that's the King James Bible. And so I wasn't going to get into that too much. Um, but I, I did, you know, I, I don't want to go in that direction. But I'm, I just want to make this clear: the New King James Version is not a New King James Bible. You've been tricked. Right? It's easier to deceive people than to convince them that they've been deceived. All right give you something to think about now uh, Proverbs Proverbs is that how they spell that in the New King James Proverbs see in the King James Bible they spell it with a V is this, was it Proverbs Oops. was it Proverbs 
11. <clears throat> Excuse me. Proverbs 11. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. Alright, so. This great verse. However, I've heard people teach this incorrectly. They, they'll use this verse to promote the idea that they are saving souls. And they are not saving souls. They can't even save their own soul. All this means when it says he who wins souls is wise. That means to win a friend. To gain a friend. That's all. You're not saving anybody's soul. You can't even save your own soul. All right. So I just I need to bring that up. All right. And so my my effort here is not to win the soul of Eric Dubai. My intention is to show the error and then show the truth. Right, to show the spirit of error and then to show the spirit of truth. And so let's continue on with that same mentality, if you will. And we'll go to this um, video. We'll start here with the Lion of Judah. I forget I forget what this is. Oh, I know. Okay, I got you. Okay. Right, the Lion of Judah is the guy in the car. All right, so let's go listen to a couple seconds here. What Jesus calls the rapture um, is the resurrection. Um, and okay, so what, what does he say? What Jesus calls the rapture... Well, Jesus never... Um, ...is the resurrection. Um, and they're one and the same thing. And um, so we're going to go over the, uh, actually we're going to go over an error that was found in, um, in the uh, yeah, Revelation so, 20, verse 5. Yeah, so he's going to claim that 20, verse 5, Revelation 20, verse 5. All right. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection all right so he's going to claim his claim is that's wrong the bible's wrong so now we got to trust what he says now he's god almighty and we got to put our trust in what he says and well what he says here is that you got to break revelation 20 verse 5 into two parts all right you notice here it says but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished that's one part, and then this is the first resurrection. Somehow, that's the second part. And so we'll. Uh, so he goes and he points to these. A uh, uh, says here two manuscripts. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. When we search the earliest manuscripts, this when somebody says the earliest manuscripts it tells me they don't believe the bible that they hold in their hands Revelation 25a the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended when we searched the earliest manuscripts remember when we searched the manuscripts our manuscripts la la dee da I've never seen these earliest manuscripts I could do a google search and I could search images of the earliest manuscripts, however you want to do it. I could do it too. And I could look at these manuscripts and my head will spin and I'll fall over. No idea. No idea what they say. Would it help if I, if I did that? Would, would this help to actually show there we go all right can you tell me what that says I want to I want to sit down with you you're you the expert and I want 
here let's just point out this one here we'll blow this one up here all right, I want, I'm going to sit down with you. This is the latest and greatest Word of God. All right, this is where we're getting all of our wisdom and understanding. Now, you see that? Now, can you tell me what this first line up here says? All right, then when you tell me, after you finish telling me what that first line says, this is the Word of God, right? This is it. We can't trust the Bible that we hold in our hands. We've got to depend on what that says right there. That's the key to understanding. If you don't know what that says, then you don't have understanding, right? So we got to depend on people, men, to tell us what that says. Because there's no way in H-E double hockey sticks that you or I can know what that says. You don't know what that says. I mean, take your time. Tell me what that says. You don't know. I don't know either. Are you telling me that this is God? All right. What's the second line say? You think you got that one figured out? The third line? How about the fourth line? This is the latest and the great. I mean, this is the earliest manuscripts, right? Whatever. Like, that matters, man. Do you really think that matters? You think this is the basis for the Word of God? Yo, know, that's like saying that God doesn't matter. It really is. Now, what I'll tell you is that the Word of God stems from heaven. It does not stem from these, this, here. This is not the Word of God. This is a crumpled up piece of paper with some scribbling on it. And it looks to be from a language that I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you what that is. Is that Koine Greek, maybe? Now, that's not ancient Hebrew, is it? I don't know much about languages. I don't. I barely know English, man. And now you're gonna tell me I gotta learn what this says? Yeah, I got no chance if that was the case. The word of God comes from heaven. It doesn't come from this here. The source of the Bible is God. It's not this. I don't know whatever you think this is. That's not it. All right, so the earliest manuscripts, and you notice here about here. Let's fast forward a little bit. And most reliable manuscripts. All right, so here he says about forty percent of the two hundred available manuscripts of Revelation. You do the math on it. That's about eighty manuscripts of the two hundred available manuscripts. And I don't know if that's even remotely that he could make that up. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I got one available manuscript, and it's from God. That's all I need. You got 200 manuscripts that don't agree with one another. I'm sure of it, and you don't know which one to believe out of the 200. So what do you do? Pick and choose what you want to believe? You have no foundation. And my guess is you have absolutely no idea what that says none whatsoever so of the 200 there's about 80 manuscripts of Revelation that do not have half of 5a of they don't have half okay so 40 percent of the 200 available manuscripts of Revelation do not have 50 percent of Revelation 20 verse 5 and 50 percent of the earliest manuscripts from the 4th century to the 13th century do not have it I can't, I tell you, I'm just as dumb as they get. I have no idea. I can't comprehend, I can't not comprehend, I can't compute. What in the heck is this guy talking about? 40% of the 200 available manuscripts do not have five. 
50% of the earliest manuscripts of the 4th century to the 13th century do not have it. No idea. I, I can't comprehend what he's talking about right there. All right, now, uh, I'm just going to, I'm too stupid. I'm just too dumb to even begin to understand what in the world is going on there. Alright, so going back further in time, the earliest manuscript available for Revelation is the Revelation Commentary by Victor Anus of Petal from 300 AD. And that commentary's manuscript did not have five. Oh, well, <clears throat> that's a big deal, huh? Well, who's Victor Anus Petal? Victor Enus or Victor Anus? Victor Enus. Victor Enus. Uh, who's that? Well, I had to look it up, man, because this guy's a big deal. I mean, we're basing our whole manus our, 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 our whole doctrine and everything that we believe in God on this guy and what he said 1,700 years ago. It's a big deal, man. So who is this guy? Well, likely born in Roman Greece and uh, he was venerated in the Catholic Church. You smell a rat? Yeah. Yeah, I smell a rat too. I mean, that not that... consistent with what I was telling you earlier? About how the Roman Catholic Church is changing the Word of God, confusing the Word of God, and rejecting the Word of God. And we are in a battle with them. Roman Catholics are not Christian. And the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, is persecuting Christians even today by confusing the Word of God and lying about the Word of God. Alright, so I, that's, about, that's all I wanted to share with you. You cannot trust these guys. Anybody that says, you that anybody that tries to tell you that you can't trust the Bible that you hold in your hands, that's not coming from God. You should know that. God wouldn't say, don't trust this Bible. God wouldn't say, hey, look, this is this is my word right here. You've got to read it and understand it. That God wouldn't do that. <clears throat> and it's very clear from reading this, the Bible that the Word of God endures forever. The Word of God transcends all languages for all time forever and ever. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we see here in verses 24 and 25, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. See, the word of the Lord endures forever. Jesus says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will never pass away. You know, it's what I called the other day the heaven and the password for heaven and earth. Right? You all have the password to get into your phone. Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about a password, right? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Languages come and go, but the word of God endures forever. And that's been promised here, I won't get into this too much. I'll just show you one. Here, in Psalm 12. Right? 
The words of the Lord are pure words. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Right? And, you know, we can go, I mean, we could do this all day, right? How hear we every man in his own tongue? The word, is God, the word of God is not stuck in some scraggly, torn up piece of paper. Alright, so let's move on. Alright, here we got a, a gentleman from the Paulusi Church. And I forget what he talked about, but we're going to play just a few seconds of this. Talk about some of the facets of this chapter. And again, I'm not going to solve all the controversies of the book of Revelation, but uh, let's talk about releasing Satan. Yeah, uh, you know, in one of our Bible studies, they said, Pastor, am I reading this right? Satan was thrown into the county jail. Then they released him. Then eventually he got to play around, and then he was ultimately punished in you know the state pen at the end, and he's dead. You know, but uh, that's an interesting metaphor. Uh, uh, I, I, there's a lot here I don't understand. But it, let's be clear. It says first that Satan, great serpent, an ancient evil being uh, that chose to depart from God. I ha I, this is not what I was going to talk about, but I have to point out the fact that the serpent, um, the dragon, the devil... Satan is not a being at all. It is a spirit that is absent of God. It does not exist. Does that make sense? It is just the absence of God. There is not a creature a being anywhere it doesn't exist there is only one God and that is that does exist is Satan is an illusion it does not exist except that it is the absence of God there's not a creature flying around with you know, a you know a tag on a shirt or whatever name tag that says Satan. There's nobody on earth or in heaven with a name tag on their shirt that says Satan. It does not exist. It's not a being. There is no being. There is no creature of any kind. It is just a spirit that is absent of God. This is not science fiction stuff, man. These people are teaching science fiction as though it was reality. Man, it just, it's disgusting. God that chose self-glory over God's glory. At some point in God's plan, yes, he's going to bind him and the nations are going to not be deceived for this period of time. Now, I look at history and say, that hasn't happened yet. There's other good Christians who who have different views of this, right? Or how it's going to come about. But I'm on the side that this is pre this happening, okay? Because it doesn't... Pre this happening? I, I don't understand that. What's that mean? It seems like in history we've seen a thousand years of peace where evil has been restrained in the way it's described. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. There we go. I think that's what I wanted to re uh, reflect on. On the side that this is pre this happening, okay? Because it doesn't seem like in history we've seen a thousand years of peace where evil has been restrained in the way it's described here. In the way that it's described here. Alright, so. It's not described. What are, you, what are you looking at? I mean, really, what are you looking at when you say in the way it's described here? That looks like a Bible. It looks like it's. It could be uh, where you might find Revelation 20 in the Bible. And he says, 
and he says uh, described here right in the way that it's described here it doesn't seem like in history we've seen a thousand years of peace where evil has been restrained in the way it's described here where where but uh, where's you where are you referring to a thousand years of peace the word peace is not mentioned in Revelation 20 makes me wonder if he's ever read Revelation 20 seriously the issue is there are 99.9% .9 of the preachers are teaching this teaching a thousand years of peace it's not mentioned in Revelation 20 so what what are they getting it from well they're getting it from one another why because they don't trust the Bible that they hold in their hands so they got to rely on what one another says see they think this is the Word of God and they don't believe this see they they believe this but they don't know what it says so they got to ask somebody and so they they come up with a consensus well what this says is there's going to be a thousand years of peace after Jesus comes all right so then that I guess that peace is going to come to an end all right God's going to be defeated apparently well I mean if you read Revelation 20 there's a thousand years of peace and then fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours the rest of the Christians God is going to destroy God's people well then begs the question who is God to you I mean you see how nonsensical this is what are you talking about a thousand years of peace it's not in Revelation 20 alright uh, I, I guess I have to do this and I enjoy doing this but for somebody that's possibly listening that has not heard me talk about this before this is not rocket science Revelation 20 is not this great controversy that so many people you know it's not a great mystery that so many people want to make it out to be it's simple this is consistent with everything that we've read all throughout the Bible and if you don't know what the rest of the Bible says I can understand really why you might struggle with the book of Revelation and in particular with Revelation 20 but I want to encourage you the more you read the more your eyes are open it's amazing it really is now in case you're new and you want to understand Revelation 20 verse 1 uh, reflects back on what we read in Revelation 1 verse 1 where um, Jesus sends his angels to John to show him things which must shortly come to pass alright so these are visions that are given to John by the angel of the Lord and so in this vision an angel comes down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon the old serpent which is the devil and Satan that old burger and uh, bound him a thousand years now think about this there must have been a time when Satan was not bound right well that's clear from reading the Old Testament that the kingdom of God was in the nation of Israel the children of Israel right and if you think of that nation as having borders and outside of that border were other nations 
and those other nations they were deceived by Satan because the kingdom of God was only inside the borders that's pretty simple isn't it so here comes Jesus and now he tears down the borders remember Ronald Reagan he says tear down that wall right that's powerful stuff man that's powerful stuff I wonder if since we got time here what are we doing here Mr. Gorbachev is that who he took tear down this wall remember it powerful powerful speech is there a 10 second clip that we can watch uh, now I want you to feel General the power secretary Gorbachev if you seek peace if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe if you seek liberalization come here to this gate Mr. Gorbachev open this gate Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Yeah, yeah, that, to me that's powerful. See, I was 16 years old when this happened, right? And the idea of liberation and freedom and the tearing down of borders, it's powerful stuff. And so what's Jesus do? He tears down those borders. He tears down that wall. And now when Jesus come, he made the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him. Right? So now there are no borders and the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ it's amazing and powerful stuff and I think it gets overlooked right all right so the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and of course we read it we read about this um, everywhere in in the New Testament in particular right Right, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So this now the kingdom of God is available to anybody. There are no borders. Right? So it's amazing. It's amazing and it's powerful. And so in Revelation 20, when it says um, the the Satan is bound, right? That means there are no more borders. So now Satan can't go out and deceive the nations like he had done before, except he'll be able to do it again after the thousand years are expired. All right, so just from that standpoint, we can figure out that end of the thousand years, it's the end of the world. All right. So I think that's that's it. That's all I want to talk about here, just um, because I want to move on. All right, now here we got this gentleman with the backwards cap. Now I remember when I was 16 years old, uh, I had a you know I wore my hat backwards as well, smoking dope and drinking beer, thinking I was pretty cool. Well, uh, that was a long time ago. This is a pretty cool pin, uh, pinball machine, though. They used to call me the pinball wizard back in the day. So anyway, I want to uh, just, um, I'm not even sure what this guy says here. Got 577 subs. 
And what, in this rapid fire study, we will cover the rapture of the Bema. What is this? Why the Bema? Is that what that says? The Bema? How'd he figure that out? It's incredible. Uh, but what's really incredible here is that he's got 2,200 views on this video that he made it three days ago. It's, that's pretty that's pretty good. Now let's listen to what he has to say. For one, that's the next event in the prophetic timeline. All right, so he's, starting. All right, so he says that uh, the rapture is the next event that happens in the eschatological timeline, if you will, or whatever. So he's right. He's absolutely correct. So the next thing that's going to happen is Jesus is going to come in the clouds of heaven. We're going to be lifted up. And our enemy is going to be gathered at our feet, and they're going to be destroyed forever. It's going to be the end of this world. And then, of course, there will be a new heaven, new earth. And uh, we'll, we'll have uh, eternal life, everlasting life. I mean, it's that simple. So he, he's got that part right. With the rapture, because for one, that's the next event in the prophetic timeline. Also, I didn't necessarily want to get into covenants, but I think that you have to have an understanding of the difference between the covenants. The way that Abraham was saved is different from the way a Christian gets saved, which is different from how people get saved after the second coming, for example. All right, so this is where... Um I don't, know, I don't know. Is there a kind word to use? He says that the way Abraham got saved is different than how you and I get saved. And then it's different also from how people will get saved after Jesus returns. Um, that right there reveals to me that this guy has no idea what the Bible says. It's incredible. How, how could you make that mistake? He's putting his trust in man and not in the Bible. Uh, how else can you make a mistake like that? Because we've all, it's always been about faith, right? It's always been a, by grace through faith. Um, it's never been about any... I mean, that's the most insane thing that anybody could ever teach. You think about the implication of this. He's saying that, well, if you don't believe now, that's okay. Just wait until after Jesus comes. And he's essentially calling Jesus Christ a liar when Jesus says that when he comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of the world. He's asked... What is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And he says it's when he comes in the clouds of heaven. It's the end of the world. But this guy says, no, it's not. Jesus Christ is a liar. And that people can still get saved after he returns. So now we're faced with this. Do we believe Jesus Christ or do we believe the guy with the backwards hat? Because they both can't be right. And it's possible that they both could be wrong. But it is not possible that they both could be right. And you see the problem, right? Because it's very clear. It's crystal clear all throughout the scripture. If you don't get what is written in... <clears throat> Now, what's going on here? In Matthew 24, uh, well, I can tell you what it says. I, don't, I mean, you can. You got a Bible, you can look at it yourself. What in the world is going on? Your page isn't working. Reload. Let's reload this sucker. It's still not working. Alright, so it, in Matthew 24, verse 4, he 
Uh, the, his disciples asked Jesus, What is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And he described, the very first thing he says is, Take heed that no man deceive you. Right? For many shall come in my name, saying that I, Jesus, am Christ, and shall deceive many. So the very first warning that he gives is deceivers. Don't let no man deceive you. Right? And then he goes on to list the, the wars. Don't be troubled. Right? The earthquakes and pestilence. See that you're not troubled. These things must first come. These for things must first happen. Right? And... The, he describes them as the beginnings of sorrows. It's not the end of the world. Just relax. You're going to hear about these things. You're going to see these things. Relax. It's not the end of the world. All right. And he says we're going to be afflicted. We're going to suffer persecutions. All right. Don't worry. If you're put in front of the council, the Spirit of God will t give you the words to say at that time. All right. He's comforting us letting us know things are going to get bad but he's always there for us all right and then uh he then uh and then uh you know of course um <clears throat> you know he's warning us again over and over don't let nobody deceive you he's telling us all these things he says behold i have told you before right there will, there will arise false Christ and false prophets, and they shall show signs and great wonders, insomuch, there we go, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Right? Don't let anybody deceive you. Okay? For as lightning comes out of the east and shines even unto the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to happen quick. All right. And then when it happens, we're lifted up in the air and our enemy is gathered at our feet and they are destroyed. They are killed. Wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Think of the carcass as the unsaved and the eagles as the saved. We're up in the air and the dead, the unsaved, are on the ground. Um, now this is both uh, figurative and literal because the great feast, the great supper is when all the unsaved are killed. Alright, the fowls of heaven are going to have themselves a feast. Alright, and so also are we up in the air with the Lord. Alright, when he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven from one end of heaven to the other now when this happens there let me show it to you it says exactly it is the end of the world what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world now in mark I'm sorry in Matthew 13 we get the parable of the wheat and the tares all right, the harvest is the end of the world. The harvest is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. The harvest is when the angels gather together the elect. And the the wheat the angels, you know, gather together the wheat into the barn, right? And um excuse me. And the tares are gathered, put in bundles, and they are burned. Now, did I have that marked, or where am I at here? I mean, if you've read Matthew 13, you know what I'm talking about. Right, right there it is. Gather the wheat. The wheat are the saved, and the tares are the unsaved, and they are bound in, they are put in bundles and burned. This is consistent from Genesis to Revelation. All right, so make no mistake about it. When Jesus comes, it's the end of the world. It even says exactly that the harvest is the end of the world. And, and there's numerous passages all throughout the Bible making this crystal clear 
that when Jesus comes it's the end of the world there is no more opportunity for anybody to get saved if you're not already saved your opportunity to be saved is right now first Corinthians 15 and it's this is so important you can't ignore this you can't run around this you can't hide from this you can't avoid it it's unavoidable when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world in 1 Corinthians 15 behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling eye at the last trump you get that at the last trump when Jesus is asked about the end of the world he says he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet all right, 1 Corinthians 15, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Right, with the great sound of a trumpet, they shall gather together his elect. All right, I want to hear you try to say, well, if you read this, it says something different. Right, I just, I'd like to see you explain that. All right, explain that, how this says something different than what we're reading here in Matthew 24 and 1 Corinthians 15. All right. I'm, that's the only way you can BS your way out of this. All right? So when we are changed, when we go from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal, <laughs> all right, that's it. That's it, Jack. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. That's it. That's it. Death is swallowed up in victory. This liar says, No, don't trust the Bible. Jesus Christ is nothing. He's insignificant. And when he comes, it's not the end of the world. And, it's, and death will not get swallowed up in victory. That's what, So now we have to either believe the Word of God or we have to believe Mr. Backwards Cap Man. Because they both can't be right. This is not anything to be sneezing at, man. This is not a light subject. What in the heck is wrong with people? Abraham was saved is different from the way a Christian gets saved, which is different from how people get saved after the second coming, for example. Think about it. If people can get saved after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven if that's true then when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven then death is not swallowed up in victory that means there will be people dying even after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven that means there will be if there's people being saved after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven then that, that, that means people are dying after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven all right and I suspect the whole reason for this teaching is because People want to believe that they can still have sex after Jesus comes. That's what I think. I think they're hiding that from people, but deep down in their heart, that's what I think. They want to continue to have sex. And the idea that they will rule over people is supports this idea and th they want to be able to control people they want to have power 
over people. They want to lord over people. Imagine this fella, he's immortal. And now he reigns and rules over unsaved people. That means they can have sex. 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 All the sex they want. Just like what the Muslims teach, right? And that's what the Mormons teach. Sex. 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 Right? I mean, it's all about the sex. You telling me I'm wrong? Alright. In First Corinthians 2, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the world. Is, I'm sorry, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away in the dirty sex, lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. All this fascination with sex is coming to an end. I mean, what are you teaching, really? If you're not teaching this idea that you're going to have sex after Jesus comes in your glorified body, glorified sex in your glorified body, if you're not teaching that, what are you teaching? When you suggest there will be people getting saved after Jesus returns, what in the H E double hockey sticks are you teaching? Okay, so let's I'm gonna just finish on this one point here. And if you do a, a search for Revelation twenty one through ten, look at this. And then you do a filter by uh, upload date, right? Look at this, what's going on here? 18 hours ago, one day ago, two days ago. And notice, notice this. State Line Baptist Church, West Center Baptist, New Life Community Church of La Quinta. West Center, there's, it's the same thing, isn't it? Okay, oh, I, see, I got you, okay. And then uh, Tri-County TV, Athens Bible Church. This is two days ago, right? West Side Baptist Church. Right, what's going on? Benjamin S S Shanks. Knock EPC. I mean, it, this is incredible. I, how is this? Is this all coincidence? I'm telling you, I could do this every day. And there will be people every day teaching Revelation 20 verses 1 verses 1 through 10 or there'll be verses 11 through 15. What's going on here? I think, I suspect that they are getting a script. They are downloading sermons from the internet. And they aren't preaching the Bible, they're preaching their sermons that they downloaded from the internet from a central location. They're being told what to preach. They're given the guidelines and does, look at this guy here. All right. I'm going to pick on to me this guy doesn't look like a preacher. He looks I like a He looks like a golfer to me. That's just me. That's my I shouldn't say that. That's what it looks like to me. All right. To me it looks like he's got a podium here and he's got a piece of paper, a script that he's reading from because the Bible's closed. This book, what if it is the Bible, it's closed. And now I always thought blue and brown didn't mesh very well, but what do I know? I'm not a fashion expert, but who cares? Now, why is it that these guys, they're all, and it's a miracle, man. It's the most absolutely amazing coincidence in the world, or that they're, or they're all getting their sermons from a CO, a centralized location, 
and they're not studying the Bible themselves. I suspect he wants to get his 40 minutes in so he can get out there on the golf course. That's what I suspect. I could be wrong. But why? Why would you cut it off at 10? It's not like Revelation has 114 verses in it. It's got 15. It doesn't even take 5 minutes to read. Alright, so when you go from here, let's let's start at here, uh, let's go here, start at 7. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints on the bluff city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them all. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead and small small and great stand before God and the books were open and another book was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works okay so now I want you to notice here we're being shown here at the end of the thousand years, it's the end of the world. All right, from one perspective, the unsaved are gathered together, right? And fire comes down from God and devours them. All right, and now we got this um, from another perspective, which coincides with this perspective. I don't know I don't know if I can explain it any simpler than that why would you separate the two in my opinion it just doesn't make any sense to me it doesn't make any sense to me I think I mean I guess if you're trying to deceive people then you wanna you do want to try to separate the two I guess I, that's the best way I can possibly understand it but make no mistake about it all right? this belongs with the rest of it right so when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world as we read in Matthew 24 for the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. This is parallel with what we read in verse 11. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So when Jesus comes, it's judgment day. It's the end of the world. Right? And when you realize this is parallel with that, then you have no um, nowhere to go you have to admit that when Jesus comes it's the end of the world and that at the end of the thousand years it's the end of the world you there's no choice once you realize that this is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven you're left with that dark reality that the thousand, at the end of the thousand years it's the end of the world when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's the end of the world and when he comes in the clouds of heaven we are changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed and then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory so there goes your thousand year sex party it's gone it's not there it's not there at all all right so again I appreciate these comments here um, from wedding 
105-1919. He says, I never listened to Eric Dubai when I watched Flat Earth videos. He was too much of a new age hippie. In the land of confusion, the deceiver is king. Right. And again, I want to just uh, reiterate this fact that it's, it's really easy to deceive people. Right. It's really hard to convince people that they've been deceived. 